Welcome to the Heart and Soul Wellness Podcast, where we inspire women by teaching applicable skills and tools and assisting them with connecting with one another, healing, and aspiring to their highest selves so they can reach their full potential. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's such an honor today. We have Jennifer Finlayson Fife with us, and our topic today is the art of reclaiming your sexuality and taking ownership for your life. So let me tell you, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Jennifer, and then she'll introduce you as well, introduce herself as well. Dr. Jennifer Finlayson Fife is a relationship and sexuality educator and coach, as well as a licensed clinical professional counselor in Illinois with a PhD in counseling psychology from Boston College. She wrote her dissertation on LDS women and sexuality and has taught college level courses on human sexuality. She currently teaches online courses and live workshops to individuals and couples seeking to develop their capacity for deeper emotional and sexual intimacy. Additionally, she offers limited private and group coaching services to individuals and couples who have benefited from her podcast and courses and are looking for more direct input on improving their lives and relationships. She is a frequent contributor on the subjects of sexuality, relationships, and spirituality to the LDS-themed blogs, magazines, and podcasts, including Ask a Mormon Sex Therapist podcast series. She and her husband are the parent of three children. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what you're up to now in your business, but also what what inspired you to move in this direction of talking about sex and sexuality and how we can improve Mm. our lives? Well, those are two very different responses, perhaps, but I'll start with the first and then go to the second. So the first, what am I doing? Well, I've been trying to do more group experiences, I guess, uh, so that more people can kind of learn. So I do the the podcast, um, you know, conversations with Dr. Jennifer. But l- about a year ago, I started another podcast called um, Room for Two, in which I'm doing coaching with couples, real couples that have pseudonyms and, you know, mask some of their identifying information, but I'm working with them on really common issues around sex and intimacy and relationships and collaboration. And so I've been doing that just as a way for more people. I teach a lot of principles, but seeing it in real life, like what does it mean for how we talk about this difficult issue? How does this principle apply Mm -hmm. to you know, how we address a longstanding issue with sex or kids or whatever. So that's been one of my most recent projects that has been really great. I mean, it's been, um, you know, we've just gotten a lot of really good feedback about how helpful it is to both hear that couples, that you're normal, right? Like other Mm -hmm. people, and also to listen in and learn vicariously, like think about, okay, wait, I do that, or my spouse does that. And what lesson can I take from it? Um, We're just, I'm also doing some group coaching. Those are, I think, currently full for next year. But also I do some, I do live events and workshops and retreats. And so we just got back from Spain. We did a a couple's tour of Spain for 11 days where I'm teaching every day. Plus you get to go see things like the Sagrada Familia and things like that. It's incredible. (laughs) it's It's a really wonderful kind of combination of, expansion and getting away from the kids and being a couple again, finding other like-minded couples, but also getting input that's kind of, you know, challenging and helping you work through some often longstanding stalemates in the marriage. So it's one of my favorite things to do. So that's That's what we're doing lately. Um, How did I get into it? I would say... Let me give you the the fast version. <laughs> There's a lot to say. I, I just, as a young person, I was definitely attuned to um, other people and what made people happy, but especially to marriage. You know, growing up in the church, I had a lot of awareness of you know being married was a big deal and very important. And then I could see people that didn't seem happily married. So I was always sort of trying to figure that out, like who's happily married and who isn't and why. So 
then when I was in my PhD program, I was asked to teach human sexuality. And this was a Jesuit school. So I was talking to young Catholic students and getting reading their essays and looking at some of the the mores and norms that they'd internalized and a lot of shame around sexuality. And, and it made me start thinking about my own cultural upbringing and religious upbringing and how did it impact people in the Latter-day Saint community. So that's what I wrote my dissertation on, which then with the internet and you know when I opened my practice a few years later, just was a, a real glaring need and very much my passion, so to speak, is to help couples be happier and yeah. how much it's linked to personal development and the capacity, learning to love, learning to invest and care in another person, coming to peace with one's mm -hmm. sexuality. They're all very related to spiritual development. And so being both an educator and coach and, you know, uh, helping people to see this in themselves has been you know, just like the most privileged job in the world. I love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's phenomenal work. And yeah, uh, so, so needed. And so let me, let me ask a question. Um, I have a lot of women that come into my practice and say things like, um, you know, I, I don't know what I, what I want in life, but I feel very disconnected from my own sexuality. Mm -hmm. Um, that's one thing that comes up a lot. And I have a lot of women asking, how can I get reconnected with myself? And so mm -hmm. my question really is, is if you could speak to um, our own human uh, sexual development and how that corresponds with one's um, emotional and integration with themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, part of, normal development, just to kind of normalize the struggle that many mm -hmm. people are in, part of normal development is learning how to be in a body, right? And mm -hmm. how to manage all the impulses that, you know, like just a little child is running around naked because that's their impulse. And so, parents are trying to socialize and teach them to inhibit and to cover up and to manage themselves so that they can be a part of civil society. And that's important, right? That's that's growth. We need to do it. It's not like the world would be better if we were all behaving like we did at two, free as a bird and without right. <laughs> restraint. Okay. So we do need to enculturate ourselves and socialize and learn to inhibit. The problem is because a lot of times the parents and teachers and adults that are trying to instill that have not grown into the next stage in a sense of being able to accept the gift of the body, to trust the body, to know the wisdom of the body, to be at peace with their sexuality. And because they haven't mastered it, they transmit an anxiety about desires, about pleasure, about sexuality that is overkill. So yeah. there's a value in learning how to self-regulate and to know when it's acceptable when pleasure is good, right? When sexuality mm -hmm. is good and when it's not. But often in our fear of our children's sexuality, our fear of pleasure, our sort of limited development ourselves, we actually handicap, we, we teach people that the body is a problem, mm -hmm. right? That pleasure is the problem rather than how you relate to pleasure is what matters. How you relate to the body is what matters. Because there's deep beauty and joy if you bring your morality to it, not a moralism, not a fear-based rigidity, but a, a a deep connection to how, uh, you know, if love is a part of your own relationship to your body and to others. And so, what a lot of people are grappling with, even if they grew up in very good families, even accepting families, is that Oftentimes, people are grappling with this question of, who am I? Am mm -hmm. I enough? Are my desires going to expose me as wretched and wrong in some way? I mean, even desires of I, you know, for example, when I was growing up, it was kind of considered faithless for a woman to want to get a degree, much less a PhD. And yet, I desired that. I wanted to have 
the education to be able to help people. And so I had to grapple with the question of like, does this mean I'm faithless? Does this mean that I'm wrong for desiring this? Does this mean I don't actually care about children? (laughs) Meaning is it antithetical to being a good mother, which I had learned was an important thing to be. So, you know, these are the, that's just one version. There's many versions of is who I am worthy? Is who Mm -hmm. I am acceptable? And we often try to get away from that question or the fear that we won't be accepted by complying with what we believe will get social reinforcement, right? And so a lot of us then, we basically don't want to attend to our desires, our divergent beliefs, our divergent um, longings, because we're afraid that it will cost us our belonging. And so we put it all away and sometimes put it away, people put it away in the name of love, right? Okay. Like I, I'm going to be selfless. I'm just going to do what makes you comfortable spouse. And Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, sexuality makes you undesirable and makes you the kind of wretched woman. And so I'm going to, I'm going to put that aside and not develop it. And so a lot of people have for understandable reasons have, have basically suppressed an awareness of themselves of their desires, of their sexual feelings in order to be worthy in the group that they belong to, in order to yeah. to earn belonging. And so to open those questions up feels terrifying, exposing, and also like they've been buried under lots of shoulds. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, one thing that I see a lot is our sexuality is very much tied into our identity. Um, the way that we see and view ourselves in the world, right? Yes. And so, um, the emotional suppression that we sometimes find ourselves in then leads to this disconnection of the self. Mm-hmm. Um, and right. so, I'm I'm curious about for someone who's like, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be living my life this way. I want to mm-hmm. embody who I am. Mm-hmm. How? Where would you say someone could start in terms of like starting to learn and understand about their Mm -hmm. own sexuality if it's Mm -hmm. been a very suppressed? Yeah. Well, I think I have two or three thoughts about it. One is to kind of, in some ways, to understand why you've gotten those fearful messages. Because if you can see some of the motivation, you know, some, some of my clients have had a parent who was sexually abused or was terrified, you know, so they would come in this very heavy handed way. My point is if you can better understand the minds of the shaming voices, it can allow you to not necessarily pay excessive deference right Mm -hmm. to that. So sometimes just understanding what's the context in which my family operated or how I internalize these messages as just being able to step apart from just, you know, um, how to say it, just accepting uh, mm-hmm. fully the messages you received. I think the second thing is to look at, it requires a kind of compassion for yourself to just make room for what is. Now, what is is not the same as I must therefore do it because I have this feeling or I must therefore you know, stay in this emotion or this feeling or this desire, but to start to be honest with yourself about what you feel, what you think, what you desire is a really important beginning place. Like, um, you know, for example, if I've gone through a period where I feel sad or I feel depressed or I feel um, anxious, but I don't know why, you know, I have clients who will basically say, I shouldn't feel this way. It's wrong that I feel depressed. I have so much good in my life. It's the wrong emotion. And so they kind of shame it or paper over it rather than more productive is the question of what do I understand about why I might be feeling anxious right now? What do I understand about why I might be feeling sad? It's not because you want to lock yourself into sadness, for example, but what can I understand about this desire or this emotion or this feeling? Like they're there to kind of educate you. They're signals. It's not that you need emotion to lead the way. I think in some ways we live in a culture that makes emotion too important, actually. But it is important to understand what it's showing you because it can teach you about what you should do 
or what you can understand about who you are or what the next best behavior might be. So, um, so it's giving yourself room to be a human being and seeing what can I understand from this? Sometimes people say like something difficult happens in their life and they think, what am I supposed to learn from this? I don't think that's a very good question. I think a better question is what can I learn from this, right? Rather than there's some failure in you that this thing is is demanding you learn something, right? Instead, like, what does this show me about myself, about humanity, about life? What can I learn from this experience? Mm-hmm. Um, the third thing I would say is watching out for resentment. Resentment is human beings love to resent. Okay. That's the idea mm-hmm. that I'm owed yeah. good things. And if it weren't for you, I'd have them, you mm-hmm. know, and what it often is, is I'm don't want to take deeper responsibility for my life and my choices. I want to blame you for not having these things. It's easier to not take the risk of choosing something, desiring something, owning that something matters to you. That's scary. That's exposed. That's There's a risk inherent to it. You may not get what you desire. It's easier to say, you know, I've done all these selfless things. These good things should be coming to me for as a reward. Yes. Yeah. Therefore, I resent that they don't rather than I have to take responsibility for my choices and how those choices have impacted me, my relationships, my development, and what's been my part in these realities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I love that because in a sense, taking ownership really is a place of empowerment because then we can see if we are disconnected, What are ways that I can then reconnect with myself? How am I showing up? And how do I want to show up? Right. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the other questions I have is, you know, we know, um, especially for women and girls, um, body image issues start very early on for young girls. And then we know that, you know, it's it's a problem, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, and body image can really affect one's sense of self and identity. I wonder what your thoughts are around um, the cultural messages around body image Mm -hmm. and how we can really take ownership in terms of um, Mm self-acceptance and this place of loving kindness with ourselves and our bodies. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think earlier you were saying something like, you know, our self-acceptance is so linked to our sexuality. And I think that's absolutely true. And I also think it's very related to our body, like our embodiment, like, can we really accept ourselves and Mm -hmm. the gift of our body. And I think this is difficult, just even if all conditions were perfect, there is a developmental element here of coming to peace with who you are, limitations and all. Like that's that's the that's the work of all human beings is how to accept your gifts without feeling better than and how to accept your limitations without feeling less than. There's a spiritual process in allowing yourself to be imperfect and still valuable. I think this fundamental challenge of all human beings, though, gets much more supercharged. It is especially for women because we put a lot of focus on the ornamental aspects of femininity. There is value in that. I I don't want to actually dismiss that. I think that, that there is you don't have to make yourself an object to enjoy attractiveness and stepping into your attractiveness. It's just that oftentimes these ideas about attractiveness are very rigid, very exacting, and um, teach girls to think that only a certain kind of feminine and only a certain kind of a female body is considered attractive rather than a much healthier and broader view that attractive is the woman who knows her strength, who accepts her Mm -hmm. body, who steps into her femininity in the most expansive version of that, like her female self and can embrace the the beauty in it, the inherent good in it. And, (coughs) excuse me. And so I think that when we have a really rigid idea then we we tell girls specifically, although boys have their own version of this, about what you have to be to be acceptable. And yeah. 
I think this is triply challenging because we also live in a food culture that actually exploits, you know, it, it how to say it, we like have supercharged foods with sugar and fat and processed mm-hmm. and unhealthy. Right. While this ridiculously thin ideal and those two are together and it basically sets everyone up for failure and self-hatred. And it's really, really cruel. I mean, when, you know, my husband and I both work online and we, we took our kids out of school for a year and traveled around the world. And one of the things that stood out to me the most in living in a lot of different countries is that healthy food was, was the option. You had to go out of your way to find processed food. And so it's just like facilitating the health of the community because it was just there for the taking where it's often very hard to choose healthy options in our food environment in the United States. So it's like we we set people up to feel bad about themselves and it's it's really unfair. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I really appreciate that you brought that up mm-hmm. because these two things really contradict each other. Mm-hmm. On one hand, it's like you need to be uh, skinny as can be, right? right? It's unhealthy norm. And then on the other hand, we constantly are bombarded with messages about food and food becomes, you know, a way for a lot of people of self-soothing um, Yes, exactly. because there's so much around food, particularly... Right. And- yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say it, it gets it into this forbidden zone. So I should yeah. be uber skinny. Yeah. And then I shouldn't have the Fritos, yet they're there all mm-hmm. the time in the checkout stand everywhere. So then mm-hmm. it gets you preoccupied and feeling like, you know, in this duality that you never can win at. And so it's very hard on the psyches of good people. And so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so one of the things that we do here is I do a lot of body work with people. We do, we have yoga, meditation, mm-hmm. do all kinds of stuff here. But Mm -hmm. one of the challenges is, is almost the shift in perspective of how can I look at myself and my body in a sense of nurturing and caring for my body instead of this self-hatred that is, that is everywhere, Mm -hmm. everywhere. we're just culturally, I just feel like there's these messages that we're constantly bombarded with and there's really no way, there's no way to avoid that, that it's just absolutely everywhere. And so subconsciously, we're receiving these messages, yet we're working really hard to shift this perspective. And so I'm curious about your thoughts around, you know, knowing that this is there, you know, Mm -hmm. how, how we can then come back to a sense of strength and compassion and nurturing my body and Mm -hmm. shifting the framework instead of it's about, you know, I got to get really skinny and, Mm -hmm. you know, there's all these diets out there and how do I navigate this yet? trying to find some balance and sense of cohesiveness with myself. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I just want to be clear. I am not an expert on this and, and I, I often get asked questions like this and I feel like, okay, there's people that know much more about Mm -hmm. working within this duality from their own lived experience and from what they specialize in. But, but I do think that um, I agree fully with this idea of, we're afraid that if we love, if we accept ourselves, then we're just going to live indulgently and recklessly on any front. If I accept my sexuality, well, then I'm just going to be at, locked in the basement. I'll never come out you know, because I'll be down looking at porn and masturbating or whatever. We have these real fears. But of course, that would not be loving to relate to our lives in that way, right? That, that, would, that kind of indulgence brings us to hell soon enough, okay? So, so it's similar. I do really think if I can love the body I have, love who I am, not shame myself for the fact that, you know, the food environment that I am in, that I am a product of that or a part of that, and to not make that a moral failure, okay? Because it isn't. <laughs> if I can even start there, well, then it kind of opens up my choices because if it's like I'm a failure and I am wrong, it sets up a kind of repression and compulsivity, right? I do the same with sexuality. And, you know, a lot of times if people feel like, well, because I feel sexual desire or I find that image attractive or what, you know, that makes me wrong. Well, it sets you up for this vacillating between repression and indulgence. And 
it it interferes rather than no, it makes me normal that I find that attractive. It makes me normal that sexuality is appealing. The next question is like, what relationship do I want to this pleasure that will make my life solid and full, that will accrue to my joy in life, will accrue to my strength? Because I think if we think more like that as an act of love towards the body, it it releases us from this shame drenched struggle and puts us more into a frame of as the architect of my life right how do i want to relate to food mm. how do i want to relate to my body what do i think is going to bless my life am i going to buy into this rigid skinny ideal am i going to buy into the food culture that's being offered to me because you can make choices in that and self define and you can do it more so when you're not just in a kind of self-hating struggle and more able to accept what is and then begin to make choices that you know bl- will bless your life, will make mm-hmm. you stronger and more at peace with yourself. Like for some people, it's a very unusual idea to imagine exercising out of a place of caring for your body, truly loving it, helping it mm-hmm. be stronger right? Saying, I'm going to take care of you this morning by going and doing this. Most of us think, oh, it has to be in this. I hate how I look. I hate this. I'm going to go exercise to get rid of the disgusting part of me. That that, That's a very difficult way to feel. And I think that, you know, broadening our view of beauty, like a lot of men actually see women's beauty in my experience, better than women see women's beauty. Like we yeah. often have this very demanding idea. And, mm-hmm. you know, as I, I taught this men's retreat and, you know, they talked about the kind of the magnificence of the wives they were with, the beauty, the like, you know, the, mm-hmm. even if their wives didn't believe them. But the mm-hmm. thing is, the husbands had a clearer picture of their wives' beauty And I know Mm -hmm. this feeling too. I really do. It's easy to self-reject. It's easy to look Mm -hmm. at the thing that you don't like and to be focused on that rather than, no, it's amazing to be alive. It's amazing to to receive the gift of this body and to see yourself more properly as you actually are, the the kind of divine beauty that emanates from from us. Mm -hmm. I love that, Um, especially in terms of expanding that view and recognizing where we're limited, where we're um, cutting ourselves short or not stepping mm-hmm. into our full potential. Yeah, it's so true. Choosing the right. choices, like you said, you know, the choices that are, you know, how am I going to show up and be in my integrity and also love myself, you know, yeah. in order to give love, we need to also be able to receive it. And so yeah, I That's really right. appreciate that. Yeah, I remember a title of a book like in the 90s, which is Fat is a Feminist Issue. And what they were saying is that this cultural preoccupation like actually becomes a way for women to throw their strength away on this kind of hyper fixation on their appearance, right? Rather than how do I embrace my strength, my beauty, actually mm-hmm. see myself as I am and be a force for good in my life and in the lives of those I care about and not get preoccupied with, you know, how much fat's on my thighs. It's what a waste Mm -hmm. of our energy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. One thing you mentioned earlier that I really um, uh, related to was, um, you know, the idea of going to school and getting an education and, you know, how that desire is very, very healthy yet, Mm. A lot of times there's cultural issues with that Mm -hmm. sometimes, not always, Um, but Mm -hmm. also even this space of, yeah, like I can, I want to be able to uh, know about my desires and make choices that support Mm -hmm. my family, but also support me in in moving forward and developing. So one of my questions is, um, you know, how to be, how can we be more connected with those desires, and then also be more aware of things like perfectionism and Mm -hmm. uh, self-denial, things like that, that may get in the way of us moving forward. Mm -hmm. Well, I do think there is some 
biological aspect of kind of this kind of self-sacrifice in the beginning of life, Mm -hmm. especially for women. I think it's connected to raising children. There is, it is more typical for women to be referencing what is wanted from them. And I think there's a survival aspect to that for children that you can track the need of the baby and the child that's pre-verbal because you're so good at mapping what others' wants are. And so that's a very good thing. It's really a skill, but of course it can become the liability because if what everybody else thinks becomes your chronic measure, well, then it interferes with you being allowed to be human, with you being allowed to have desire, with you being allowed to be sexual and strong and able, because then we have the idea, well, that precludes me caring Mm -hmm. about others. And a lot of us were actually taught that idea. You're, You're either selfless or selfish which one are you going to be? You know, you're like, oh, I guess I better do selfless, you know, (laughs) right? Right. As opposed to, I think a truer idea is, and, you know, the good news is that a lot of times men are are more ego-driven in the beginning. And then a lot of times they cross paths as they get older. Men start to lean often more towards their relationships and women often, you know, start a career or something a little bit later on once their kids have gotten older. Obviously, couples do this in lots of ways, but that's not an unusual pattern. So, uh, but what I think is if we get stuck in, I can't be okay unless you're okay with me, well, then we will either do just keep doing selfless resentfully, which isn't actually selfless because you're still trying to earn a self in everybody else's eyes, but you resent that you have to give up who you are. Mm-hmm to get it, or at least you perceive you have to, or you like screw that and you start doing selfish literally. And like, it's my turn now. And you can kind of betray your Mm. relationships by sort of saying, now I get to do whatever I want because I've given up too much. And both of those are relatively immature positions, even if both are understandable. What I think is a more mature frame, and it's one that I talk about in my Art of Desire course is how do I, so so as human beings, I talk a lot about the fact that we want two things as human beings. We want to belong to others and we want to belong to ourselves. We want our group to accept us. We want our spouse to accept us. We want to be valued by our children or important people, but we also want to belong to our own goals and our own thinking and our own dreams. And that's a fundamental tension in men and women. And so, how can I be true to you and me? I think that's a better question. Mm. And are you selfish or selfless? That's like one prevails, the other submits. Rather, how do I be true to aspects of who I am? How do I develop who I am and not trample you? Right? Mm -hmm. Or how do I sacrifice for your benefit without destroying the core of who I am? That's another version of it. And so there's a fundamental tension in human beings and in our relationships, but it can help to even understand that that tension exists. And if we go too far in one way or the other, we'll undermine what we need, which is we need both. We need to belong to others and we need to belong to ourselves. And so we want our choices to represent an effort to find that balance. Yeah. I appreciate that because I think that balance can be so challenging. I remember when I was going to grad school and I was constantly in the space of, you know, I want to grow, but I also am so connected as a mother and I don't want to mm-hmm. miss out on anything. And so yeah. I remember going through the struggle of um, wanting to be fully engaged with my kids and then yet also knowing that I also had a strong yeah. passion for education. And, and yeah. you know, I'm really grateful that I that I moved forward with that. And of course the challenge was how do I balance these yep. multiple roles? And, you know, it was, it was a lot to take on, but yep. um, I'm grateful that I did it. Uh, one thing I think we struggle with is letting go of things. Sometimes I think yes. that as women, we have this long list of expectations yes, for sure. yep. and it's very challenging sometimes even to ask for help or even to say, you know what, I can't mm-hmm. do it all. Or even say no to some Absolute, things. Absolutely, hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. 
It's like the, the part of our development is, you know, the courage to disappoint others. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yes. You know, and to not be like a lot of women, you know, that I work with have this demand. I want to be needless and wantless. I don't get helped. I only help. You know, I'm mm-hmm. trying to prove that I'm worthy by being everything for everyone and developing my career on the side. I mean, it's like, wow, yeah. you know, like that's, a, that's exactly. a tall order that we place on ourselves. And then if we can't do it, we think we're failing as opposed to, yes. I'm, I am thankfully and truly a finite person, a mere mortal, as is everyone else. And I can't be everything. You know, it's just this way we can talk to ourselves. I can't be everything to everyone. What matters most where am I going to put my energy and where am I not going to put it? I think because a lot of times our identity gets wrapped up in these demands, like a lot of times why, you know, there's books written about the second shift and that women are coming home from, you know, being in their master's program or something and then cleaning the house while their husband does less um, is in part because her identity is linked to how clean that house is. And so if someone comes over, it's more her fault than it's her husband's fault, right? It reflects on her as a woman when it doesn't reflect on him as a man, if they're in a sty, you know? (laughs) And so so that's part of the difficulty of negotiating this is that she's trying to prove she's doing it right. And we haven't made that cultural shift uh, or I should say, or the woman has to let go of certain identities that she's going to fulfill in the minds mm-hmm. of others in order to claim the ones that matter more to her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a piece of this is that acknowledgement of how perfectionism shows up in our lives, mm-hmm. but also um, like, like you mentioned, things we're going to let go of. And then the other piece is like, well, how do I accept my failures? Failures are not bad. They're just part of my development. Yeah. But there's this shame story that we often, yeah. that seems to be fed into the right. perfectionism. Right. And, and I wouldn't even, I would even yeah. be careful with the word failures. Yes. I mean, I know you're saying yeah. what we say to ourselves yeah. often, but how do I, how do I accept my limitations without mm. making it somehow a problem, right? Yeah. Rather than to be human is to be limited. Now, that's not a vote against development by any stretch. It's just to accept what is. And then what do I want to do in the face of that limitation? A lot of us start our day with this idea of like, I have 700 things to do. And if I don't get them all done, I'm a failure. Kind of like we're already in in the red when we wake up in the morning. (laughs) And rather than I made breakfast. I made that phone call I've been putting off for two days. Like if we would even do a done list, it's like a way of challenging this idea that if we don't do everything, you know, we haven't gotten out from underground. We haven't gotten out of the red, which is just such a harsh way to be human. It's Mm -hmm. instead of like, I have a day and a body and I get Mm -hmm. to choose what I'm going to do with it. It's remarkable. I could sit around and do nothing and still be valuable as a human being, but I have options about how I want to utilize these resources. And just that mind frame doesn't, it doesn't deny limitation, but it doesn't pathologize limitation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And um, I appreciate that because I really feel like if we can come to a sense of belonging in terms of, you know what I am, I do have limitations, Mm -hmm. you know, and I can Mm -hmm. acknowledge those Mm -hmm. and work with those. Mm -hmm. And so then we can bring in almost this compassion for, for who we are, instead of it just being one sided, right? Like being perfect or showing up yeah, Yeah. for ourselves and others. It's like, it is the binding aspect of humanity. It's like, when you are like, look, I have limitations, you can go into a a hatred, which disconnects you from yourself and others, or you can go into a self-compassion, which connects you to others. That is, we're all limited. We're Mm -hmm. all struggling through. Life is hard. And I can care about myself and us in this project. So when we can accept it with love, that's that's the thing that really binds us Mm -hmm. to one another. That's the thing that opens us up to intimacy. It's like, it's the vulnerability. It's the underbelly that we're often trying to man- to to guard the larger world from seeing. We're trying to pretend it's not there. 
we think that's our strength to pretend it's not there, but it actually becomes our Achilles heel rather than to be human is to be limited, to be human is to be vulnerable, truly. And can we love in the face of that inherent vulnerability and be good to each other, be good to ourselves? Mm, Thank you. I love that. Um, I've just really appreciated this conversation and um, we'll go ahead and tell me when is your next women's retreat? When is that going to be? So I'm doing an Art of Desire women's retreat in the United Kingdom. So we're going to um, be... I, I can't remember if we're going up to Scotland or not. We're at least in England for that's awesome. 10 days. And so I'm doing the art of desire retreat and, you know, same thing you get to, we're going to go to the Jane, mm. Jane Austen rent costumes. Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna, awesome. we're gonna, like we're going to weave in yeah. some of the themes from some of her, yeah. her literature. Um, but um, so we'll do that. That's next September. And we're also having, I believe, and my assistant will know the actual answer here, but I believe in the beginning of May, we're doing an Art of Desire retreat in Spring City, um, Utah. Awesome. So, so oh, those, that, oh, yeah. And then there's, there's going to be one in Austin that's just a two and a half day event in Austin, Texas. And I think that's in October of next year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Okay. We'll put your website in the show notes. And mm-hmm. I want to thank you so much for, for talking today. Yeah, my pleasure to be here. Thank you for listening to the Heart and Soul Wellness Podcast with your host, Sarah Carter. Make sure to like and subscribe. And if you have any thoughts about what we talked about today, leave a comment. Also, you can find us at heartandsoulwellness.org and on Facebook and Instagram. Join us again as we continue to help women heal, connect, and aspire to their true and authentic selves.